As someone who shoots a lot of film for my personal work, the Fujifilm X-Pro3 is a digital camera that I've been interested in trying ever since its release. Welcome back to Pushing Film, my name's Hashem and Fujifilm Australia was nice enough to recently let me borrow a Fujifilm X-Pro3 body with a couple of lenses and a Leica M-mount adapter. And of course one of the most unique things about the X-Pro3 is that its conventional LCD screen is hidden by default and instead in the normal position all you see is a small information screen. But what I've always admired about Fujifilm X cameras is the ergonomics and layout of the manual dials, which brings it closer to the film cameras of decades ago when it comes to control and usage. And this combination of design elements, as well as Fujifilm's renowned in-camera control over the output, including some rather popular film simulations, is what initially piqued my interest in using the X-Pro3 in much of the same way I would a 35mm film camera. Being just as light and compact as many 35mm systems was a big plus, meaning I was much more inclined to just pick it up and take along compared to something like my Canon 5D, while still offering comparable image quality, if not better, despite the smaller APS-C sensor. With all these factors combined, the X-Pro3 can be pretty much as direct and pleasurable to use as most film cameras, with the exception of perhaps comparing it to an actual rangefinder system, something I'll talk more about later in the video. So the idea with that screen that's hidden by default is that it keeps you more in the moment as you would when shooting film. Now this is something that's obviously completely up to you. Even if you had a digital camera where the screen was showing, you could just hide it or tape it up. Or even with some cameras that have the ability to just flip the screen and hide it away, you can of course do that. And it's just a matter of having that personal willpower or control. But what the X-Pro3 tries to do is shift that default way of usage and somewhat force you into using the camera in a way that you perhaps would with a film camera. Generally speaking, through my usage, it was a camera that was great to just pick up and use to document everyday moments or to pick up and take along as a daily carry. And as polarizing as the hidden screen is for some, I personally find it great for my style of documentary photography where I try and remain in the moment and less in the camera's menu or playback screen. The small sub monitor defaulted to showing the current film simulation icon or logo but I changed it to show the essential and useful camera settings and information. The construction and ergonomics of the camera felt great with the added bonus of being weatherproof. I took the camera and shot it side by side with my Leica MA at a rally over in Perth during the rain. And it felt quick and practical, especially when using the autofocus system. So looking through these shots will give you an idea of the output all being straight out of camera JPEGs, shot with the ProNeg High simulation. I was still experimenting with different simulations at this point, discovering some of their strengths and weaknesses. So this brings me to what I'm sure many of you are curious about with the X-Pro3 is how the output compared to actual film. So at the rally I shot a few different actual film stocks, so the comparisons aren't as direct but it gives you some idea of the somewhat distinct difference when it comes to comparing film scans with just about any digital camera's normal output. And of course the film shooting experience next to digital is going to be distinctly different, each offering their own pros and cons. But we're gonna focus more about how that experience can come closer, including how the output can perhaps bring you a little bit closer to what you might expect from shooting film. So the Pro Neg simulation gives a pretty tame and flat look. So films like Superior, Tri-X and Portra that I shot at the rally all showed a lot more character in comparison. More contrast and saturation and of course the grain. And generally speaking you have to keep in mind there's a lot of variables when it comes to the film scans including the machine that was scanned on. For all the colour film scans I'm showing you in this video they were done on a Fujifilm Frontier by Halide Supply here in Melbourne. Lab scanners like the Frontier tend to bake in a unique look onto those film scans. So what about comparing film simulations in a more side-by-side -side sense with some closely equivalent film stocks? The first one I was curious about was the newest classic Neg Sim, which is supposed to simulate Fuji Superior 400. In my findings, this was the most film-like simulation out of all of them, but also the least predictable. I found it looked great with some straight out of camera JPEGs like these, but not as suitable to some other scenes where it produced sometimes a washed out look or added a little bit too much of an odd color cast. So in that sense, it was great in bright and contrasty scenes, 
and while it desaturated a lot of the colors and added luminance, it didn't tend to desaturate reds as much and gave them an interesting distinct look as you might expect from actual Fuji Superior 400. It had some noticeable blue shifts to the shadows and to the greens. So it was the most interesting and daring simulation out of the bunch with the heavy shifts to hue, saturation and luminance and even to the tone curves. Proneg is another film simulation that I was keen to try because it emulates one of my favorite film stocks which is Fuji Pro 400H. It's a more lifelike simulation compared to something like Classic Neg but I found the default version to be a little bit too flat so I tended to prefer the Proneg High version. As you might see in some of these scans, the film had a much brighter look because with the digital shots, especially when it came to shooting JPEGs, I had to expose to protect the highlights, something that you don't need to really worry about as much with film where you can expose for the shadows and get that brighter look. You can, of course, overexpose the digital shot, which I tried in a sample like this shot here, and it will actually create some distinct color shifts to the actual digital shot. But either way, the Proneg High gave a good starting point with some similarity to the colors of Fuji Pro 400H and especially if you shoot it raw and apply the simulation in post in something like Lightroom, it creates a good foundation for matching two films like 400H or even Portrait. The next simulation I want to talk about is Fuji Acros, which I found to be excellent match to the actual film overall. And the rep from Fujifilm was actually nice enough to send me a few rolls of the new Fuji Acros 2 which was perfect because I'd run out of any original Acros stock that I had in 35mm. So I used a roll of Acros 2 side by side with the X-Pro3 to create some comparisons like these. And I can see why some people really love the Acros simulation on Fuji cameras. It comes really close to the actual film, especially when combined with some of the in-camera settings that you can enable in the Fujifilm X-Pro3, such as adding grain, which in this sample here, I added the weak and large grain combination, which brought it pretty close to the actual Acros film scan and looking at them when they're zoomed out, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. I'll probably go more in depth into the Acros comparisons and even some of the other simulations in some future videos and live streams. So make sure you stay tuned on the channel if you wanna see more direct comparisons and going a little bit deeper into how those simulations compare. But moving on, my favorite all-rounder simulation was Astia followed by Provia. Classic Chrome was also great and I can see why there's a lot of fans of that. I used it for some night shots of a musician which I was doing portraits of on Fuji Superior 800. So shooting it side by side with that film and then applying the Classic Chrome simulation to the RAW file in Lightroom, it gave the best foundation for matching to the Fuji Superior 800 shots. So this brings me to night and low light photography, which for me was one of the biggest strengths of using the Fujifilm X-Pro3 when shooting alongside film. With the ability to push the ISO higher than I would ever normally go on film and easily compose using the electronic viewfinder and rely on the great autofocus system, digital had a clear advantage in this department. Even when using adapted manual focus like a lenses on the X-Pro3, there was another clear advantage there because with manual focus, you can enable the great focus peaking and other focus assist options, which made shooting night scenes like these a lot easier. This is one of those situations where that hybrid optical viewfinder was a really nice feature, allowing you to use the optical system when you feel like it and the electronic viewfinder in situations like night and low light, where it is a lot more suitable. The output was naturally different, but night and low light photography was a breeze overall. And the images looked great with low noise, even at high ISOs. And when you combine that with the ability to use some of those great film simulations like Classic Neg and bake in some of the grains and shoot straight out of camera JPEGs like these, even though it looked different from the actual film scan, it was a great result overall without the need for any editing with all these straight out of camera JPEGs that I'm showing you here. So one of the biggest draw cards of the Fujifilm X-Pro series in general is that hybrid optical viewfinder, which lets you switch from an electronic viewfinder to an optical view of the world in front of you with some additional information overlaid on the bottom, including some useful focus assist features. 
This can be great with certain lenses and focal lengths where you might have frame lines that allow you a little bit of extra peripheral view on the sides, which lets you anticipate subjects coming into the scene as you would with a traditional rangefinder system such as the Leica. So with no lag or simulation of the depth of field or things like exposure in the viewfinder, this can be great if you'd like a more direct view when shooting in quick situations like on the streets. All right, so one of the things I really wanted to test out was the shooting experience of the X-Pro3 compared to my Leica or similar rangefinders, meaning using manual focus adapted lenses from the Leica and the optical viewfinder on the X-Pro, which is one of the, the great features about it. And so far I've found that experience pretty enjoyable. One thing, however, you have to keep in mind is that there's going to, of course, be a crop factor with the lenses. So the lens I'm using at the moment is the Voigtlander Ultron 28 mil and that becomes something like a 40 mil so that's still a pretty workable focal length on the street I don't mind it too much but it is getting a little bit tight so keeping that in mind as well as the fact that where your zones normally are on the lens might differ and because it's an adapted lens where for example I'd have my finger in the middle for that 1.2 meters focal length let's say is a little bit different on the X-Pro so where I'd normally have my finger for that become some more like 1.5 or 2 meters. So I have to adjust and relearn those finger positions. So that is another thing to keep in mind if you are going to use adapted lenses. So what I might even do here is take a shot on the Leica, which is loaded with Fuji Pro 400H, just for a little bit of a comparison. I'll probably just shoot at a 30th of a second at 2.8 because this is limited to the ISO 400. So that should be about right. All right. Shooting street was easily my favorite thing to do with the X-Pro3. And although, at least for me, it didn't quite match the experience of using an actual rangefinder, that wasn't what I set out hoping for it to do. And the X-Pro3 definitely offered its own unique shooting experience. And I think street and documentary photography are probably this camera's strongest selling points. Compared to any other digital camera I've used, the X-Pro3 offered the closest thing to the film shooting experience. And it may not be for everyone, but I can see how this camera would suit a lot of people's shooting style. I'm really thankful to Neil from Fujifilm Australia for organizing the loan of this camera, letting me try it, use it, and talk about it without any restrictions or expectations on the video. In the few weeks that I got to use it, it was a pleasure to use. So of course, the only way to get the full film shooting experience is to actually just go ahead and shoot film. But if you're happy just to get some of that experience or you want a camera to complement your film camera, I think the X-Pro3 makes a great option. There's a lot of advantages that digital provides that film obviously can't provide and the other way around. So I think the X-Pro3 makes a great companion to a film camera that you shoot regularly or if you're someone who just can't afford film or justify the costs but you want some of that experience, this can make a great option. Benefiting from things like those great straight out of camera JPEGs heaps of in-camera settings to tweak and fine-tune the output to your liking, minimize time looking at screens with those direct controls and dials and that nice little sub-monitor feature on the back of the camera. This is a camera that I definitely enjoyed using and would recommend to you if some of those features sound good to you too. I'd like to make a special thanks for Halide Supply here in Melbourne for providing all the color film scans that you saw in this video. The role of Acros was home processed and digitized by myself on the Canon 5D Mark IV. Feel free to join the Pushing Film Discord server that I have linked in the description of this video to become part of the community and join future discussions. Thanks for watching this Pushing Film video and I'll see you in the next one.